welcome. We're so excited. We have our board member, Kim Solom here to start us off. Kim, take it away. Hi everyone, and welcome to our seventh annual Free the Seeds Fair. This is our second and hopefully last time doing a full virtual event. Free the Seeds is a community-based project of Land to Hand Montana, which was formerly Farm Hands, <laughs> and it's rooted in building a sustainable and resilient future through real seeds, real food, and real skills. Land to Hand's mission is to build a strong community food system that fosters socially just ways of accessing food, and Free the Seeds provides all of us an avenue to build that system. While this is a free event, it takes time and money to make it happen. And if you would like to support our efforts, please go to landtohandmontana.org and donate through the donate button on the homepage or the donate link on the Free the Seeds page. And we'll also provide the link in the chat. Finally, we wanna thank this year's major sponsors who are Box of Rain Organic Garden Center who offers gardening supplies and classes in Kalispell and we'll link to their website in the chat and Save Farmland, a new nonprofit based in Whitefish working to preserve farmland. And finally, to all of you who are amazing seed savers who grew and saved seeds for us to package. At this year's seeds giveaway, 75% of the seeds were saved by our community. I'd like to introduce our speakers today. We have Anna Gret and Klaus Pfeiffer from Cattle Care Organics, and they will be presenting from seed to potent skin care, let your backyard be the healthy, the source of healthy glowing skin. A little about Cattle Care Organics. They're a family business headed by Annegret and Klaus and supported by a small team of dedicated employees. Klaus is the chemist and physicist with over 30 years of experience in lean manufacturing, R&D and ISO certifications. And Annegret is the face of the company for customers. She has a strong background in finance and serves as the operations manager and as the head of sales and marketing. And their philosophy begins at home. Anna Gret suffered for year, four years from a chemical insensitivity to the ingredients in conventional skincare products before finding the soothing, enriching power of pure and natural skincare. Since her early 20s, she has experience in formulating her own healthy creams and lotions a knowledge she now passionately utilizes on a larger scale at Kettle Care. Thank you, Kim. And now we will turn it over to Annegret and Klaus, who will be taking the presentation on from here on out. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation today. I'm so glad that uh, we could make it. We're very excited to share our uh, passion of healthy skincare with you. And also want to share with you today uh, what you can do for yourself at home and how you can utilize your dark, your flower plants and your surroundings to create basically a beautiful healthy skincare. Um, okay, with that, uh, this is our presentation today that you we already got introduced to you. Our mission here at Canada is to make And again, I'm going to interrupt. There's a bit of an echo, which wasn't there before. I'm not sure if there's something different about your microphone right now. Okay. Oh, that sounded really good. Okay, so is this better? Then I just leave it out with my phone. Does it sound better now? Uh, I can still hear the echo. Okay, one second. We'll turn down our speaker here. this better? Let's try this. I think it's better. Okay, let's see. Just let me know. I will continue and just let me know how it works for all of you. So our mission here at Healthcare, and we have been, Healthcare has been around uh, since 1983, is a mission to make skincare as natural as possible. Um, with that, let me just move on. You can ask, what is it that makes us passion, passionate about our skincare? And what we like is to work with wildcrafted and organic community source botanicals, which is what we want to show you today. 
Um, we take those botanicals and the extracts in house. This ensures us to uh, control the quality and purity. It is something you can look at as well at the end of this presentation. In our skincare, we also use an abundance of therapeutic and aromatic essential oils. And our skincare is very concentrated. And I will show you in a minute why we like the concentration like that. They're very clean and nourishing, which really helps my skin uh, since I have a chemical sensitivity. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt to again. Chemicals. And for that reason, we also try to naturally preserve them. So we don't use uh, tablets and parabens. And Anna we Grant? have a, yeah. So the echo is back. Is there any chance that you have a speaker on, like that there are two devices that are playing right now? No, and I turn your whole volume down really low here. Um, Maybe speak not as loud. Let's see how that sounds. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you for letting me know. And we do... To go back, we do a small batch, but a high quality production. And maybe that is something you want to start to do at home as well. Um, it sounds so great. So when we look, what makes us passionate? We like to see, uh, we like to see that our land and the soil that we're using for the botanicals are healthy. And usually, and that's probably also the reason why you are all connected to this uh, Zoom presentation right now, is because you care about healthy land and soil because it provides us more nutritious food. And with more nutritious food, our well-being is guaranteed. So we definitely feel better with high, highly nutritious food than with food that doesn't give anything to our body. How's the presentation so far, uh, Whitney? It's good. Can you still hear an echo? I couldn't before, and I can a little bit now. Um, someone is suggesting maybe when you're closer to the microphone, but that whole time you were speaking, it sounded good. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. So why, as a skincare company, um, do we care about the healthy land and soil? And this is a big, big point. Our skin is semi-permeable. We sweat out the toxins and we all can feel that. But what is equally important is that 60% of what we put on our skin goes directly into our bloodstream and it affects with that our organs. So there is no buffer by digestive enzymes that might break down toxins and make them less toxic, or it doesn't give the liver a chance to filter out toxins. So whatever we put on our skin, 60% of that goes directly in our bloodstream. So with that knowledge, it really, if you really think about it, our skincare and what we put on the skin affects our health tremendously. And if we use uh, toxins on the skin, then that affects our well being. If we use chemicals that are very harsh to us, it affects our well being. And so many of our issues, especially skin issues, come because we don't have. Uh, healthy skincare. And if you look at your skincare at home, the one thing that we recommend is turn it around, ignore what's on the front panel, turn it around and read the ingredients. That is one of the first things you should do. Just like you read your food labels, read the skincare ingredients because they have such a tremendous effect on your health and your well-being. Um, do you have any questions at this point before we continue? I haven't seen any. And just a reminder to folks, please put it, any questions you have in the Q&A, the two thought bubbles. And thank you so much. All right. 
then I will continue. So can we put this also on there? Can you see the presentation or is there our screen sharing? Can we move this? We can see where do we find land and soil in our life? Yeah. So if you look around and we really look, where do we find nature basically or land and soil in our lives? It is, you step outside the front door, it's your lawns. It's garden beds, it's flower boxes, it's patio boxes. If you go into your neighborhood, it's parks, um, curbside planting between um, your walkway and uh, the road. And then if you go more in the recreational area, it is forests and basically fields. However, all of that is nature. If we look at each of them, and let me go to if we go and look at these places and we start to wonder thank you can we eat from these places and we would immediately say yes we can eat from the garden beds and probably from the fields some people would pick maybe from the forest we can pick the berries but can we eat from our lawns the flower boxes, the patio boxes, the parks, the curbside planting. Usually we can't and we don't and we shouldn't. And so I thought we just look at it and look at the opportunity that we can create for us to create corners in our life where we can um, put botanicals in or where we can plant botanicals that we can utilize for skincare and that we can plant botanicals uh, that we can maybe eat. And so one of the immediate ones is the lawns. Have you ever looked at um, the lawn as a source of skincare botanicals? Um, usually not, because it has only Kentucky bluegrass. So what I would encourage you is to look at lawns as <laughs> very diversified green carpets. So maybe instead of just having Kentucky bluegrass and then treating it with um, herbicide and fertilizers, maybe we can go let the lawns get natural and this way dandelions can grow, plantains can grow, chickweed, maybe even clover. And all of that can be a source that we can use for skincare. We can even eat it um, and pick leaves here and there. And it would also provide a great uh, food source, especially in early spring with the dandelions for our pollinators, especially the bees. Um, by not putting herbicide on the lawns, it is also healthier when you walk on it because herbicides have toxins in there that go especially through the feet of your, through the sole of your feet, again, directly in your bloodstream. And they have effects. It increases your cancer rates and um, your overall health. So I don't want to go too much into it. But yeah, if you walk by barefoot on a lawn that is treated with herbicides just to carry it green and nothing else in it, but the one grass that you want, it is not very healthy for you to walk on it barefooted. Um, if we go to our garden beds, usually we like to keep those very clean because we think that we could separate the lawn area from the gardens. But keep in mind that many times the rain washes the herbicides into the gardens. It also washes the fertilizer into the garden beds. So they're not as healthy and pure as you think that they might be. Then if we look at our flower boxes and the patio boxes that we have, what I often and more and more often find is that many of the annuals that we purchase at even the nurseries, the local nurseries, or on the farmer's market, that they're treated with 
systemic uh, fertilizers. And systemic fertilizers are fertilizers where we have herbicides that we actually, um, that the flower digests. And then if uh, bugs or pests would come in, the plant itself is so filled with herbicide that uh, nothing will happen with it. However, if you would eat that flower, um, you would eat that herbicide as well. And the same goes for our pollinators. If they go and uh, get pollen from plants, especially roses that are often treated with systemic fertilizers, they have health problems as well. So when you buy flowers, uh, be sure to make, yeah, make sure that you don't buy uh, flowers that were treated with systemic fertilizers. Because otherwise, instead of helping the pollinators, you actually um, affect your health, their health pretty badly, or you even kill them. Um, another thing is when we look at parks and curbside planting, as a community, we could probably consider to do the same thing that we could do with our lawns to get let them uh, get naturalized, where we allow dandelions, clover, plantains, and um, other weeds to grow that could be very beneficial for the pollinators or also other animals that um, live in the park or in our natural areas around us. If we go to the forest, I think the forest is still an area that is very natural, where we find a huge variety of plants in one square foot. If you go in the forest and you take like three, three square feet, that's usually a really good uh, number. You take three square feet and you look at how many different plants grow within that a plot of land, you will find, I would say, at least 10 different ones. It's really amazing. And that is the kind of natural variety and abundance of uh, plants that uh, we should thrive for maybe in our lawn, maybe even in our yards. It's really amazing. Um, if you go to the fields, then we find some really healthy fields or we find fields that look uh, pretty dead and they have um, only one plant growing in it. And often those fields have been treated with herbicides as well, Roundup or other herbicides. And if you want to see how many fields have been treated with herbicide, especially when you live here in Montana, a great way is uh, to check it out is in the fall, when you drive across our area, you can see the harvested land and uh, the harvested fields of the grains, especially out in the Great Falls area. And if you drive down the highway, look and see the fields that have a golden shine to it and the fields that look dead and gray. They have the same kind of stopples. Uh, from the mown grain, but some look gray, gray and some look more golden. So all of those fields that look gray, those plants have been treated with uh, Roundup before harvest. And it is done in the industry to treat the grains with Roundup because it dries out. Mm -hmm. It's to dehydrate. Um, the grains. So when you harvest them, that they don't start to mold. So it keeps their harvest safe, but we basically eat uh, wheat that is contaminated, wheat, barley, oat, whatever it is that's not organically certified, that was just before harvested, drained with, uh, drenched with Roundup. So it's not very healthy for us. Uh, so it's a nice way just to at times get a feel for it, how many fields are treated that way. Do you have any questions at this point? I do. This is from Trisha. Concern about mm -hmm. pollution from traffic and herbicide from runoff from neighbors' lawns. What's the safest way to wash the plants that we use? That is a very good question. 
for one thing is yes watch wash the plants and it's like for a minute or two just put them under running water that helps to get any contamination from the traffic off another way to get uh, for example herbicide or other sprays off is you take one gallon of water and you put one teaspoon of Clorox and apparently it is one just Clorox don't take any other brand and then you put the uh, the vegetables in that and let it sit for a few minutes and then you rinse them off if you want to um, restore of what you have destroyed with the Clorox just again take a gallon of water and put a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar in it and let it sit for a few minutes and then just rinse it off apparently and I don't have any proof but apparently I have I personally have heard that kind of formulation now many times in the last um, first time I heard about it this was about 20 years ago Thank you. We have one other question that's about your skincare products. Will you be covering that later? Okay. The question is, um, I'm allergic to most commercial skin and makeup products, especially any that contain perfume. What's your best skincare product? Okay. I will get back to that then later on as well. Thank you. Thank you. So, now, if we consider that we could use our lawns, our garden beds, flower boxes, and patio boxes as actually a very, very natural and healthy place, then we can also utilize whatever grows in them. And our invitation to you is that you keep your yards as natural as possible and you just watch over the years what kind of abundance and varieties of plants we turn. And that is a philosophy that actually started over 30 years in Europe, where when you look at the density of population in Europe, there would be, just as a comparison, if you take the state of Montana, we are a little bit more than a million people right now. And we have, as far as I know, we are 1.1 million people at this point, and we have 2.2 million uh, cattle. So that's a nice uh, comparison. In Europe, you would have on the same plot of land, 80 million people. So you can just imagine the density of population. So that, if you have that kind of density of population, it starts discussions about your healthy soil and your healthy food at a much, much earlier time. And so 30 years ago, people were looking at their lawns and they realized we cannot keep treating, every neighbor can keep treating their lawn with herbicide and then fertilize on top of it. It is just, it creates an insane amount of um, toxic environment. And so the trend and community discussion was to just don't do anything to lawns as long as they're green, let grow whatever's in there and take the lawn more and mow over it at the end of the day. And when you go back to Europe now, or when Klaus and I go back and visit, what we see is an abundance of dandelions and actually they celebrate the dandelions. If you go in the spring in parks, in city parks, even there, you see dandelions that are this tall, it's all yellow. And in between they have their tulips, and roses and other formal plants. And people just actually wait and long for the dandelion bloom because for them it's the um, emergence of spring and it's the first pollinator for the bees and they care very much about their bees and their pollinators. So it's really fun to see that while we are more in a culture that is very concerned about dandelions, there are cultures by now and it changed. Really, it started 50 years ago, so it's funny to see that change, where they celebrate the variety of plants in their lawns. And um, we also want to invite you to plant a variety of culinary, culinary and skin beneficial plants that actually naturally thrive in your climate and uh, zone and backyard. Because we believe that every garden corner and 
uh, flower pot can be a nutritious and a skincare beneficial space. And it's really, really fun when you start to look at uh, that in this way. And let me just continue here. So when we look at Montana, and it might be different in, or it is different in California, depending uh, on where you live, if it's Northern California or Southern California, definitely. But the first plants that come to my mind here in Montana would be comfrey. It grows in every abundant, uh, abandoned garden corner. I would recommend put a big comfrey plant in there it's amazing and i will show you some photos in a moment chamomile is just fabulous calendula peppermint very healthy invigorating lemon balm um, very soothing and antiviral plant chickweed and plantain both of those love to live um, grow in lawns and um, they're amazing you can make amazing saps out of them for that uh, soothe eczema that are good for uh, bug bites and other things. And then more, I think, in the wild areas and the forests, you find horsetail alongside of um, waterways and Annika in the forest. I mean, Annika, you should see those pop up in April all the way through June, depending on um, the elevation. Um, these are the ones that we like, especially in yards. Um, but let me show you some photos. So if you look at this one, does anyone know which seed that is or which uh, seed pot that is? It looks like an alien one. We really, really like this one. And so I like to show it off. Uh, so this is um, Calendula seed pot. You can see this. We use calendula uh, resina. So if you look for calendula flowers, they are the garden ones that have very big and very showy flowers. Or you can use a skin beneficial one. Yeah, this is the resina here um, with smaller flowers. However, they have a huge amount of resin. And that resin in the calendula that is sticky when you pick the flower is actually those contains the healing properties of the calendula. So uh, you can find that. I think I have it somewhere later from, yeah, I will show you where you can get it. So this is the calendula resina, if you look for it. And here you can see it. We harvest it with a terrapin farm. And the seeds of that calendula, yeah, you can get at the triple divide seeds which is a Montana seed company. It's a cooperative where um, um, Terrapin Farm is part of it. And here we are harvesting the flowers for us and the seed pots as seed harvesting for triple divide seeds. And you can see they're not the big showy flowers and we're also harvesting them fairly early in the morning where the flower is not quite open yet. Um, but they are the ones that are super skin beneficial. Then chamomile. Chamomile will grow in every corner of your yard. Just take the seeds and let it grow. And then next year it will propagate. And I like chamomile um, because it's also called the doctor's physician. Uh, yeah, the physician's plant. Because what the monks found out in the early 1400s when they studied the medicinal herbs is if they put a chamomile plant next to a sickling plant, in nine out of 10 cases, that plant recuperated. It really liked the energy of the chamomile. Um, chamomile is also really sweet because it is one of the few flowers that puts the leaves down when it sleeps and the sun goes away and it doesn't put it folded up but it puts down and then when the sun comes around it opens those petals back up it's really really sweet how it sleeps and here you can see a field of chamomile it looks just beautiful so you can have annual plants or you just put uh, chamomile seeds down so it looks beautiful in the yard this here is comfrey 
Many people are not familiar to comfrey, but you can see it's a huge plant. It grows very vigorously and you can use the roots and you can use the leaves. Actually, the leaves you can cut three times a year with ease, if not even four times a year. You can dry them, uh, can shatter them around the yard and you can put them in your compost. They're very nutritious. And they're also great, a great pollinator plant. You can see here the purple flowers are just absolutely loved by the bees and all the insects that come in your yard. So if you ever need a comfrey plant, come by our place and we will dig one out for you because they're very prolific. Um, we gladly share them with you. So comfrey is very great. It's uh, uh, cell rejuvenating, which we really like. Uh, it's very healing for your skin. And then there are the wild crafted herbs that you can get. You can see on the left hand side is the horsetail. It's the one more in the middle. Let me see if I can take my cursor here. This is the horsetail, the one that you can take apart. And this here is the arnica. So really quickly, when you wild craft botanicals, what's so very important, take only one out of 10, and if you have to, one out of five, but leave the other ones there. Nature loves its abundance, and uh, we shouldn't just harvest it all. And usually, especially for skincare, you don't need a lot. So you don't have to come home with bags and bags of uh, botanicals. If you have two handfuls, that is plenty for what you want to do for your skincare. Do you have any other questions at this point? Yes, I have a few. So one follow-up, is that wash that you described safe for flowers as well? No, I would not use it for flowers. I would use it for the vegetables that we are purchasing or that we get, yeah, that we basically purchase and we don't know how they were grown. If you have any, like let's say you had calendula in your yard and you were worried about herbicide drift, would you wash it or what would you do with that to use in skincare? I would not use it. Okay, that's a good answer. <laughs> my other question, well, it's not my question, is um, yeah. for chamomile, any variety, only German, what is best for chamomile? Actually, it's the Roman chamomile, a very good uh, question. Roman chamomile is very powerful, but so is the German. So you can uh, go on the internet and look at the difference. Um, I think the Roman is the more potential one. Or it's hard to say, or either way could be good. Um, if I look at... Um, Skin beneficial properties, I think either one, when you make an oil infusion or an extract, either the German one or the Roman one would be okay. If you use essential oils, and that is more the oil content, we would recommend the Roman one. Got it. Thank you. That's all we have for now. Okay. All right. So that brings us then... Um, once you have planted your botanicals, that brings us to the question, how to use them in skincare? And um, the first thing is we can either use them fresh or we can use them dried. And if you use them fresh, you have to remember that then they have a higher water content and we have to use them very quickly because whenever there's water in an ingredient, it uh, can, mold can grow with that water. So if you use fresh uh, botanicals, like you go outside and you pick the chamomile flowers, you pick the calendula flowers, you pick some horsetail, you can ground it up and make it really um, fine either in a mixer or with a mortar, and you can use it in sugar scrubs and then use it up in two weeks. I'm, uh, but the sugar itself can preserve the botanical. 
Or the other thing is I would make a bath infusion. So make a tea out of it, out of the fresh ingredients, and then pour the tea uh, in your bath. And that will be a fabulous, fabulous bath. For all the other uses, we recommend that you dry them. It's really a great process to get rid of the water and to keep the, ingredient, uh, the integrity of the nutrients. And you can do that by simply putting them on a screen or let them air dry on a table. Use a shady, non-windy space. Because especially when you use Arnica, it dries up like a, a dandelion. And then the slightest wind can just blow your Arnica away. It's really funny. And it happened to me once. So trust me. B, it's a non-windy space. And you can see here we have the dried um, calendula. And then the dried calendula you can store or any kind of dried herb, you can just store in a mason jar like this. Uh, oh, you can't see me. Um, you can store in a mason jar and uh, then you can use it. I, we recommend to use it up within the year and then just whatever you have left, uh, when the next harvest begins, throw it out, put it in your compost and start new again. So how do we integrate botanicals um, in skincare? So when we look at skincare, we look at two things. Skin needs moisture and hydration. So the moisture is provided with oils and butters. And those would be wraps, salves, and body oils. So those are just oils. Or hydration, those would be the water-based ingredients. And this is when you see water or aloe vera or flower waters. And products, skincare products would be that just have that are toner, spritzes, um, yeah, those are usually the more water-based ones. And uh, creams and lotions, those are a combination where water and moisture. So that is called, this is, and we get those together in, by making an emulsion. So creams and lotions are a little bit more sophisticated to make at home. You can either use, um, if you use beeswax, you also have to uh, put them in a mixer and mix the emulsion. And then it really depends on, here you can see what we do. It's a very intricate process because it's um, temperature-based. It is time-based on the mixer and the velocity on the mixer, just because beeswax and water and oil emulsions can get pretty, pretty tricky. If you ever do it, I would recommend take um, emulsifier. You can buy those, those uh, vegetable emulsifiers. They aren't chemical, but it's easier to do those at home. So we have these uh, three formulations, the oil-based, the water-based, the creams and lotions, which is a combination of them. And we basically, now want to take our botanicals and ex extract them, the essence of those botanicals. And the way we do that, so um, we have three carriers, basically. We can either take the oil and make an oil infusion, or if we have a water-based carrier, we make extracts. That's what you see on your label as an extract. Or we have a steam distillation process. And in a steam distillation process, you end up with two products, which is the essential oil and the hydrosols, or you can also call them the flower water. And I will show you that in a moment. Uh, so that you can see those three different exa ex uh, extraction processes. Let's start with the water-based carrier. Here you can see how we do it in big one-gallon glasses. You can still see the botanicals in here. Like here, this is our horse chestnut extract. And then we have our extracting liquid in here. And we shake those glasses on a regular basis. And then eventually we um, 
press those, uh, the liquids out. And that's how we have extracted the essence of the horse chestnut in a water-based liquid. And if you look at it, we can have three different um, carriers to uh, water-based carriers to extract the botanical. One is water. So it, that would be similar to tea that usually has a limited shelf life. Uh, you have to keep it in the fridge or you need a preservative for it. You can use alcohol to extract your botanicals. Then you would buy a bottle of Everclear, uh, put the botanicals in a glass, cover it with the Everclear, shake it once in a while, and then um, filter it out. If you use alcohol, they actually have a shelf life for up to seven years. And you need to have at least a solution of 30% alcohol by volume to be self-preserved. Um, the other uh, thing that you could use is glycerin. Glycerin is, for example, the method that Mountain Meadow Herbs likes to use that is down the earth. Uh, and it's also similar to what we do in cooking when we use a simple syrup, where you use a cup of sugar, a cup of water, and then you uh, use your, for example, what could you put in there, um, fruits or other things where you basically extract the essence of that botanical or uh, food. Um, there are also extract methods that work with organic solvents. However, we do not use that here. We also do not recommend them. So these are the three methods you can use with water-based uh, extracts. Let's move on. Have a quick look at the steam distillation. Some of you might have a distill at home. Basically, if you look at this photo here, you can see the steam distillation process. Down here, you have a pot of water and that water will cook. So you bring that to a boiling point and up here, you have a globe with the botanicals. In our case here, we have um, all kinds of winter greens and evergreens. And once the water cooks, the steam will go through these botanicals and rip out the essential um, parts of this botanical and the steam will carry up here in the globe where we catch it and funnel it down and cool it. Here's a double cooling tube. Can you see cold water goes in here and cools that tube? So this steam will become water again, only that now that water also carries the essential oils of this botanical. And when we cool down the water, it automatically separates out the oil and the water because the oil swims on the water. Here you can see this is the water that is now uh, infused with the essence of these botanicals. And up here, this little bit is the essential oil from this botanical. And that is the steam distillation process. And the two products are, is the hydrosol, which is that infused water. And up here is the essential oil. So that's another way how we can use uh, the botanicals in the skincare. And now let's go down to the oil infusions. They are done very, um, it's a very simple process. You basically take the dried herb and you can choose any kind of dried herb and then you put it in a pan or a mason glass and you pour oil over it and let it stand for i would say about two weeks you can shake it once in a while um, but let the botanicals be covered for about two weeks and uh, then you filter it and use the oil that is now infused with um, the properties of that botanical. And that is one of the skincare products that I would like to introduce you to. Uh, it's our oil infusion project. 
And I chose this one because it is simple to make and it is so versatile. You can use it for so many different things. So, um, or products. So basically you take a jar. Uh, I would recommend a mason jar. I really like those. And you fill it about two thirds with your favorite dry botanicals. You can do a combination of it. You can use just one botanical depending on what you're aiming for. And then you fill the glass with oil so that those botanicals are well covered and they will swell up. Once you cover them with oil, they will swell up a bit more. So that's why you shouldn't, uh, that's why you should only use two thirds. And then you just shake that bottle or glass daily and um, make sure that the botanicals are mixed well with the oils. And after two weeks, you strain the oil. It looks pretty much like that. And then after two weeks, you strain the oil. You can uh, use this or you can um, use a cloth, run it through a cloth and do it that way. Um, and then uh, you can leave the oil. Can't we get? You can fill the oil in a bottle and you can use it as a body oil. You can also add essential oils to it, then those give a quite nice aroma. And you can use it as a body oil, or you can use that oil now and make your creams, your lotions, and uh, other skincare. Lip balms. Lip balms, yeah, lip balms are super awesome. And we recommend that you use it up within four weeks because um, that oil is not, it doesn't have any preservative. So be careful if you don't use it, leave it in the fridge. And then when you're ready to use it, take it out and use it up, whatever you have within four weeks. Do you have any questions at this point? Yes, we have lots. So the first question is, what is a good source to identify the skincare benefits of the plants that you mentioned? So a website or books, what's a good source? That is a good question. We have several books that we use. The quickest one is probably for everyone, go um, on the web and do a Google search. We, um, you will find your favorite ones there. They're different. I should probably write them down for you. That's a really good question. There are different sources on the web. Um, I can, uh, let me, go back in a minute and I get the titles of the books that we usually use. Um, but on the website, you find your favorite ones. I think, um, are we, do we have any favorite ones? Not really. But if you do a quick Google search, you find the, um, the main skincare benefits. So when you go searching on the web, you can search for either like herbs, for certain conditions, you type in the condition and it'll start to pop up all sorts of things. Um, if you have certain herbs already in your backyard, you can type those in and ask what they are used for and you'll also get a lot of the answers there, which is uh, cheaper than having to go buy a book. Did you hear that? Yes, and that makes perfect sense. Um, the other question that we had are what oils work best? What are the best sort of carrier oils? That is a very good question. So it really depends on what you aim for. For example, we love the jojoba oil. If you have any kind of skin condition, if your skin is compromised, if you have babies at home, Pohoba oil is a very waxy oil. It's very close to the makeup of the sebum that your skin produces. And so that's a super gentle oil if you have eczema, any kind of skin conditions, compromised skin, if you want to use that. For me, the easiest way to explain it is if you put jojoba oil on, 
just getting this method to think about to say, okay, what is it that I need to do with this ingredient right now? It can just um, take it in. So that's why I like cocoa oil for some uh, products. We like uh, the sunflower oil. It's a nice uh, basic carrier oil. The safflower oil is a little bit more emollient. It provides, it has some different nutrients. Both of them are good carrier oils for body lotions, hand creams. Um, it works really good as a base oil. There are more expensive oils, higher priced oils that we like to use for, uh, for facial care. Those are pomegranate oils. Evening primrose, definitely an anti-aging um, oil. So is um, rosehip seed oil. It's a very age-defying oil, pomegranate oil. Um, olive oil we like to use for uh, products like a wrap or a salve because it's anti-inflammatory and it helps for the product, the essential oils, the extracts. Uh, the botanicals that we have infused in the oil to get drawn deeper into the skin and the body. Uh, what else comes to plus, us? Plus, you can get very good extra virgin organic olive oil at Costco, which is very affordable. <laughs> yeah, so that's an, for us here in Montana, that's an easy one to grab. Um, uh, if, you, if you want to have something that feels a bit drier on your skin and not too oily, then you want to go towards a grapeseed oil. Yeah, that's a grapeseed oil. So basically, you can go in the grocery aisle, in the, uh, in the grocery store, in the oil aisle, and pick up the oils. The ones that we do not recommend is canola oil or a standard vegetable oil. If you look at the ingredient label, that usually is canola oil. And canola oil is a GMO, uh, it's exclusively GMO grown and not healthy at all. So we recommend that you stay away from it. We personally don't use soy oil simply because it's such a GMO contaminated oil as well. Um, but sunflower, sunflower oil are very good, uh, basic oil are very good carry oils. You can just go and get those. That's great. We had another question. When making the oil infusion, does it need to be kept in the fridge during that two week infusion period? No, I, I wouldn't keep it in a fridge because it'll, some of the oils will get pretty hard. Um, so normally you keep it at room temperature. If you're worried about that, you do have any kind of microbes or bugs on your plant material, you can just heat up the oil in a water bath to about 160, 170 degrees, or let the water boils. So you have your mason jar in there, and you keep it there for half an hour and then let it cool off. And that way, if something was on there, it got killed, and then you're pretty safe. So you can put it in front, on your windowsill and have it in the sunlight during the day to warm it up a bit. It's pretty straightforward. Do you have any other questions? One question. Um, I don't know if you mentioned almond oil. Is that a good oil? Actually, yeah. Thank you for asking that question. I didn't mention it because we eliminated almond oil a few years ago. And the reason is that we found that more and more customers came in with an allergy against um, uh, to almond oil and actually anaphylactic shocks. So. Since it is a nut, we started to eliminate it. If you don't have an almond allergy, yes, almond oil is a very nice oil, very emollient, so very soft and thick on your skin. Um, however, almond oil is usually treated with a lot of um, yeah, herbicides. So uh, just see if you find an organic almond oil. And the other problem with almond oil is they have to, it's sustainability, right? They have to grow it in warm places, like in the deserts in California. So, and they use a lot of water to grow. So that's another reason why we don't buy it. Sort of like palm oil. Right? It's one of those things that's nice, but it, it kills the environment. Agreed. 
And um, I think you mentioned sunflower as a good oil, right? That was one of the yeah. things you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Perfect. That's all I have for now. All right, then I will continue. I have one more recipe for you that I want to share. Again, this is a base recipe. Um, if you don't want to get into oil infusion, but you have different plants in your yard, uh, a water extract in form of a tea that you then can use as a hair rinse, for example, is fantastic. You should really try it out. I can highly recommend it. So next time you go and see some horsetail, just grab a handful or two and go and uh, take it home. You can also use peppermint leaves that you find. They grow a lot here in Montana in the forest. Chamomile that might have grown in your yard, calendula, and mix it all together and make a very strong tea out of it. And when you go in the shower, go and rinse and wash your hair. Go and rinse this, um, take the tea and rinse your hair with it. It is fantastic. The horsetail has a lot of silica that makes your hair smooth. The peppermint um, is uh, invigorating to your scalp. The chamomile soothes scalp inflammations. And the calendula is just very supportive to the health of your scalp. So your hair will grow really nicely. If you want, you can add a spritz of apple cider vinegar to it that will smooth the cuticle of your hair. Um, I personally don't like apple cider vinegar because no matter how little I use, it smells very strong. Uh, but just give it a try and see uh, this, the smell might go away. Um, but just try it out. It's a very, very easy way to use the botanicals. And you can always go and drink the tea. You can make a tea, a chamomile tea, and drink it. It's very healthy for you as well. Even horsetail apparently is a good tea to drink and supports um, healthy um, hair growth. Oh, another one, I didn't mention it here, but you all might want to write it down. Another one is nettle. So if you live in an area which we are not necessarily, the stinging nettle is a really good one to support the health of your hair. Um, and it, the reason is it uh, blocks a hormone that is responsible for early hair loss that's called DHT. And it just blocks it at a... a healthy level so that you don't get too much of that hormone that it causes the layer on the hair loss. And so you can drink that tea and you can also use it as a hair rinse. If you have hair loss and suffer that, make a tea out of horsetail uh, and nettle, drink it and also use it as a hair rinse. And that brings us, uh, one second, to the question, how can you assure to get healthy skincare if you don't make it yourself? And the one thing and the mantra you hear from us over and over, read and understand the ingredients on the label of your skincare. And if we still have time, then Klaus will walk you through that, a really quick um, presentation of the slides, how to read your skincare ingredients. But let us know much time we still have we still have plenty of time we have a half hour total left um we have a couple of quick follow-up questions but then if you want to transition to that i think that we have plenty of time okay perfect so the questions we have are for the oil infusion and the water are those both dried herbs can they be fresh how do you do um are they wilted what is that Okay. For the oil infusion, we recommend dried herbs. And the reason is we don't want to have water with oil mixed that can cause bacterial growth. And we don't want that. So if you um, want to make sure that you have uncontaminated skincare, dry your herbs and then put them in the oil. If you make a water infusion, it really doesn't matter. You can take the fresh ones, but the fresh ones only last for so long. And so for the rest of the, when they're out of the growing season, then 
the way to preserve the botanicals is to dry them and then you just use them just like you would use a tea. Perfect, thank you. And then the last follow-up I have, is the hair rinse left for a certain amount of time before rinsing with water? Um, no, you leave it in, it's the last rinse. You don't wash it out. Mm, perfect. You just put that, you, you rinse your shampoo out, you rinse your conditioner out, or yeah, you rinse the conditioner out, and then you um, apply the hair rinse and you don't wash that out. It is just the tea, there's no honey, nothing sticky in there, no oil in there. It is just the water rinse. And so you basically leave it in the hair, dry the hair and style it as usual. Thank you. And then we have a question about comfrey and I can speak to this. So comfrey grows really easily here. Um, and so our lovely presenters offer that you could come on over to their garden and get some purple frog gardens and whitefish is also very happy to dig up comfrey and share it with yeah. everyone. <laughs> so <laughs> you can get seeds or plants all over and it really propagates really easily. And that's all I have. All right, then I will uh, let Klaus continue here. He is our chemist and he can answer all kinds of tricky questions for you. Okay, I will then give you a quick rundown about how to read labels. Um, I'm not gonna go into every detail, so if you have specific questions, just ask them here. And as you can download the file afterwards, the presentation, you will have everything in the presentation. So I made the foils a lot more detailed than a normal presentation foil. So everything will be in there. Let's see, how to read a cosmetics label. So actually cosmetics, you can actually get a pretty good feel what's in them. It's a lot better than food. Uh, every time when we look at our regulations for when we make our products, we get pretty frustrated when we go in the grocery store and see, oh, they can write on there whatever they want to. Or, so for cosmetics, the very clear regulation is everything that is above 1% in your cosmetic has to be in the order of its concentration. And it's the concentration by weight or percentage by weight. So whatever is on top of the label has the highest percentage by weight. And then what's underneath is less and less and less and less. It goes all the way down to 1% and they have to be in the exact order down to there. And then once it gets below 1%, it can be in any order, but it all has to be listed. So what does that mean? In general, everything that is in that cosmetic is listed on the label. Wish we had that on our food. Um, let's see, the names. This is where the, the how do you say, abbreviation INCI comes up, I-N-C-I. So INCI is international, international specified naming of ingredients. Usually you will find that the ingredients use their common names. And common names are the names that you usually use as a regular person. And Inky then usually once it's a chemical, it'll have a very chemical sounding name because it's very specific about which specific chemical it is and which version. So Inky is usually the better way to find out what you're dealing with. If the companies are not listing inky names on their label, then they will have them usually on their website. So that's where you can find out what you're dealing with. If you're trying to find out, um, yep, what is that ingredient? What is, why is it in there? What it is used for? The common website to go to is ewg.org. And that's the Environmental Working Group. And they are very, very, how can I say that? They are very cautious about what, about their rating. They basically give materials a rating from one to 10. Usually everything up to three, they consider good. And then it's like, well, yeah, if you have to, that's usually from four to six. And once something has a rating above six, they say you don't even want to get near it. And they're very conservative on how they evaluate um, how good a chemical is. The lower number is always the better number for them. The highest number is the highest warning. So when you want to check an ingredient, you can Google the ingredient, just type in the name of the ingredient and then behind it EWG and it'll take you directly in a search to their website. 
Now, if you have a non-inky name, a common name, then usually you can find it. And sometimes you'll then find out that it's not very specific about what the real ingredient is. It'll be a group of ingredients perhaps, but it won't be specific. So again, ewg.org, that is the website where I, when I develop new products for us, that's where I go and see how they list things. And for us, we always try to stay below a four. That means anything up to a three. Um, next thing, when you go and look at the label, usually the ingredients that you don't want to have are at the end or the bottom of the label. If, if they're on the top of label, that's really bad. But usually most suppliers in the meantime have learned that customers are looking at it. So there's stuff that you don't really want that's usually hidden somewhere at the bottom of the label between all the small printed kind of ingredients. And they tend to have all different kinds of names. And I just listed a few here in my foil here where I said avoid. So the first one is anything with a paraben. I'm pretty sure all of you have heard about those. Um, they're very, very strongly suspected to be endocrine disruptors, which means they can disrupt your hormone system and balance. So that's why people in general don't want to use them. The sad thing is they're a very, very good preservative. So it's, they're one of the best ones out there for preservation. It's just like uh, it might not be good for you as a person. So it kills the microbes and it kills the people that use it if you're not uh, very careful. Um, and there's different versions of paraben, so it doesn't really matter if you see something that has the word paraben in it. Um, personally, we stay away from those. Then there are a couple of others in here, like DMDM, Hydontoin, and then there's something with urea at the end. So urea at the end usually means it comes from a uric acid. And in the end, really, all of those uh, materials that I'm listing here that also have like the oleone at the end and others, they are all uh, formaldehyde releasers. So they release formaldehyde over time. Formaldehyde is perfect for preservation. I mean, they use it for dead bodies and other things, and nothing will touch it. The problem is uh, they're carcinogenic. So if these materials slowly release a little bit of formaldehyde, the hope of the industry always is, well, it's such low levels, it won't do anything. But I don't know if you want to take the risk. So a lot of countries, especially in Europe, uh, formaldehyde releases have been uh, outlawed. Then underneath you have some like triclosan and others and TA tri, triethanolamine and others. So those are all the kind of materials you don't really want to see in a healthcare product. Let's see. Now that you've gone past all the really bad stuff that could be in there, then there's things on the top. And that's where I said check the beginning of the ingredients list. So like that's where you have soaps, surfactants, lubricants, and other things that show up. And usually our recommendation, and a lot of this uh, actually comes from the Environmental Working Group website from ewg.org, is we try to avoid anything that has PEG in it. And it's not because it's not super necessarily bad, but it's polyethylene glycols. So glycols, that's like what you have in antifreeze and others. So we personally believe we don't really want to have that in body care products. Then there's other things that have the, uh, the letters ETH or F in it, like sodium laureth sulfate. And there's like sodium laurel sulfates and others. It's usually the SLS thing in shampoos and others um, where people are trying to stay away from it right now. Because they, and the reason is when you look at the EWG site, is in the way that they're doing the chemical processing, there could be a dioxins in there. They're not supposed to be in there, but they could show up. So that's why they've gotten a bad rep. They are perfect for cleaning otherwise, um, like most of these things. And then there's something in there that I call cones, C-O-N-E-S, usually like dimethic cones and other kind of things. And really cones means it's silicone. So, they're oils that are based with um, silicon in their lattice instead of carbon. So they don't exist in nature. They're totally synthetic. And who knows how long they live, which is why they like to use them in car oils, because they last a whole lot longer. 
And then we say, okay, look at the ingredients in terms of is there anything like fragrance, FPNC or DAPNC. Um, so those are usually where companies hide fragrance oils. And fragrance oils, um, lots of people have allergies against them. And the main reason is most of these are molecules that have nothing to do with the original scent that you were looking for. So they might smell like a certain flower, but they never were in the flower because they're all synthesized and just by sheer accident, they smell the same. And sometimes actually they can be good. They are like basically the synthesized version of organic ingredients that have been in that scent. But in general, we would say stay away from fragrance oils. In our products, we don't use them. The only thing we have is we have like a little pocket perfume because some uh, plants that people would like to have pocket perfumes from don't have essential oils. So then they have fragrance oils and then we, we list that out. But that's like two or three of them. Otherwise, we don't have any fragrance oils here in our plant. Yeah, and then I would say buy products with ingredients that you understand and trust. If you haven't been at ewg.org yet, go there, have a look. If it has a low rating there, then it really is a benign substance. They are very, very overcritical. So I think they're a very good spot to go to, and I use them a lot. And then, so not to go too long, I'll talk one more bit about natural. What does, what does the word natural mean in terms of ingredients? There is no um, definition for what is natural. Um, they are trying to get something together there. So it's a bit like with organic, they have certain standards. With natural, there aren't yet. However, if a, su a supplier or manufacturer writes 100% natural on there, it better be natural or naturally derived. And I have one example in here, for example, citric acid which is what gives the sour taste to lemons. Um, citric acid, there's so much citric acid being used in the world, there's not enough lemons around to get all that. So the majority, the super majority of them are all synthesized. And then once it's synthesized, you can't call it natural. And that is starting to go through courts where companies, like big companies are getting sued when they say it's all natural and they do have citric acid in there. And there's other ingredients like that also that you can't really get as natural in the amounts that people want them. Now organic, everybody I think here knows, so that is actually a very well protected name. And I think I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. There's different levels of organics in uh, body care products. And then depending on the level that is in there, then the label can do, be designed differently. So if something has less than 70% of organic ingredients, then you cannot use the term organic as a product on the front. If you go up like 70% and above, you can say it's organic somewhere in the label, but you cannot say that it is that it has the USDA organic seal. If it has more than 95%, then you can display the USDA organic seal and 100% organic is straightforward. So just by looking for, does it have the seal and where is that seal on the, on the jar that you're looking at, gives you a few for how much of the ingredients are organic, if that's what you're looking for. And then yeah, non-GMO, um, we still keep harping here on GMO. So we talked earlier about sunflower oil. So we actually import our sunflower oil from Europe. And the main reason for that is in Europe, GMOs are illegal. So they can't be used. And so we know if it's organic from Europe, it is non-GMO. If you look in the U.S., sunflowers have also been a GMO in the meantime. So it's difficult to say 100% for sure that they're not GMO contaminated. And the thing that helps you there is if something says it has been non-GMO verified by the project and has that seal on it, then you're pretty safe. But we took the safe route, so we're importing those things from Europe. And I think that's really what I have here, not to bore you too much. But that's our recommendation. Read the labels, have some feeling for how you interpret what you're seeing. Any questions? I don't have any questions. Um, 
right now we have one person who wanted to comment that um PEG was in some of the vaccines and so J and J might have been a safer option for some people with allergies. So one second, I have to turn up my volume here a bit. Um, you might have an echo. So could you repeat that again, please? Sure. I said we don't have any questions. Um, one yeah. person wanted to comment that um, PEG was in some of the COVID vaccines, but that J and J was a safer option for people with an allergy to that. Yeah, and 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 so polyester and glycols in general are not a problem. Or it's just like if you can't prevent them, don't have them around. Our opinion. Wonderful. And I think you read the same and on the EWG. <laughs> that makes sense to me. And I think Annegret has some books here that she would like to show you for Great. how you can get a feel for what herbs to use for what. So I have one book. It is about the medicinal herbs, rosemary, that star. She's very, very good. So any kind of books on rosemary, that's the stars, would I recommend? So this is a very, very good one for beginners. But I highly recommend. So if you can get it, it's very cool. It's a lot of more, 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 more. The next one. Can you see it on the screen? And I can write it down in a moment as well. Let me do this here. Oh, yeah, that'll help a lot. And I'm putting the link in the chat also. But okay. Yes. Okay. Here. Then the other one, and you do your one. This is not what it is. You can't see, but you can put here about this one. And it's actually oil, so very fishable. Wonderful. The last link that I would like to put in is the link to Kettle Care Organics. And do you have any particular products you might recommend? That is a question we had earlier for people who are allergic to a lot of skincare. Or I know you could probably recommend all of your products. <laughs> yeah. So I want to mention these things in the first as possible. And, uh, and I will give you a this about the um, I was really so glad that I dedicate the skincare even to you know, that I gave it at all. So that it was such a nice surprise. Um, and I personally don't have any allergies to any of them. If you have a lot of allergies, I would recommend some of the sensitive skin cream. It is made with those parts, so you don't use any water, you use the hydrosol. From the most distillation, and it has no essential oils, so um, it doesn't have any fragrance. It has uh, yeah, essential oils and the fragrance, like a lot of oils smells like lavender, cannabis smells like lavender. So, if you are super allergic, uh, that thing is only made with extracts, and it's comforting and electric, not that cannabis. So, very soothing extracts. Stop is that. We're having a little trouble hearing you again. Let me get oh, closer to the microphone. That's Is it better? Clear. Yeah, yeah, really clear. 
If so, you could repeat about that one that you were just talking about without essential oils, I think. Okay, I would recommend the sensitive skin cream because that does not have any essential oils, just the extracts. We use chamomile, comfrey, and um, calendula. They're very skin loving, very soothing, anti-inflammatory. And a little goes a long way with our creams and, ex, uh, creams and lotions. So use about a third of what you would use for any other uh, creams. And uh, the other thing is um, put it on after you have washed your skin and then apply a little bit of our creams and lotions and you will see a big difference. We often see when people start using natural high quality skincare like ours, that many of their skin issues just go away and it's a non-issue anymore. I really think that the standard skincare industry, um, it is so full with um, chemicals that are harsh to the skin that that can in itself can cause a lot of issues. Thank you. Um, I don't have any more questions in the Q&A here. And I will speak for myself in saying that this has been very informative and I have loved learning from you both. Um, Thank is you. it okay, of course, is it okay with you if we share these PowerPoint slides with the attendees after the webinar? Yes, I will email you the updated one, not the one that you got three days ago, and then you can put that one on there. Would that work for you? Yes, that is perfect. And just so all the attendees know, the recording of this webinar will be posted on our website, Land to Hand Montana, and also um, on YouTube. Within a couple of weeks, we'll have that posted and we will send these slides out to all the attendees if you're interested. Um, and I just wanna quickly thank our sponsors, Box of Rain and Save Our Farmland. And I'm seeing there's a question, do you have pet care products? <laughs> you know, to be honest, any of our products you can use for pets. <laughs> there is no different. You can use the hair shampoo for pets. It is very good. Make your dog a hair rinse out of horsetail and nettle. The dog's hair will absolutely love it. Um, if you have, if this dog has any kind of skin issues like eczema, use our herbal skin soother. It works for the dog as well as it works for you. You probably don't have to give the dog an expensive facial cream. I don't know if that would do anything, but for skin conditions, yes, use our skincare as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, just so everyone knows, I did put Kettle Care's website back in. Um, do check out their products. They're wonderful. Um, and I also put our donation page if you would like to donate because you appreciated this webinar. And I don't know if you guys can see the chat, but it's just full of people saying thank you and appreciating all of this wonderful knowledge you've shared with us today. Thank you so much for attending today. It's a great honor and a great honor to work with Free for uh, Free to Seats. <laughs> I know it's a tongue twister. Yes. And if you have any other additional questions or so, you're always welcome to stop by our uh, company and our company uh, yeah. store. We'll give you a tour and then we answer any questions you guys have. Yeah. Email us. Just chat with us, okay? Thank you. Thank you and as so a reminder much. to everyone, there are more workshops throughout the weekend. So feel free to check out those. There's lots more to learn. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have Thank a good you. evening. Bye. Bye.